Welcome to the Fee for Service Dentist Podcast. Today we got a special guest, Dr. Richard Maddow. And if any of you have been in dentistry for any period of time, I know you have heard of him. He's a phenomenal force of nature and very much for the positive. And he lately he's done a lot more of management and those kind of things. But he started out with the original newsletter, the Richards Report, and really has been a groundbreaking kind of guy. And he and his brothers uh, have done phenomenal help across the board for dentists. So our podcast, as always, brought to you by Kettenbach. Kettenbach Dental has a brand new product called Vesalis Fill and Vesalis Flow. It's a light cured nano hybrid composite. It's highly filled over 80%. High polishability and strong durability and aesthetics. It can be used anterior or posterior. It has a flex shade system from A1 to A4 and the bleach and opaque shade. So please reach out, contact Tettenbach, 877-532-2123. Talk to Dan, tell him Sonny sent you. If you like the show, please share it with your friends. Click like, subscribe. If you don't like it, well, please tell me, sunnyspira at gmail.com or my cell phone, 607-624-2962. Appreciate you all for listening. Today, you're going to hear Dr. Ritz talk about the magic words for that patient experience. Enjoy. My name is Drew Burns, and I'm a part of a small group of dentists who believe something crazy. We believe the standard of care is just not good enough. We demand the best of ourselves and the best for our patients. We believe the best way, no, the only way to practice dentistry is on our own terms. If you ask the dental consultants or the corporate CEOs, they tell you that what we're doing isn't smart, that fee-for-service dentistry is dead, and that the golden age of dentistry is over. Yet, while others focus on profits first, we focus on the patient first. And yet, our offices are some of the most profitable in the entire country because we invest in ourselves and we are doing things right. It's our name on the door, and it's our reputation on the line. My name is Drew Burns, and I am a fee-for-service dentist. This is the Fee-for-Service Dentist Podcast, and these are our stories. Welcome to the Fee-for-Service Dentist Podcast, Dr. Sonny Spirit. Today, we have a special guest. This is kind of one of my heroes growing up in dentistry, Dr. Richard Maddow. And uh, you guys may have known him, us old-timers that remember back when we got newsletters. And he just, he brought a different energy and a different vibe to dentistry, so I'm really, he reached out because of Steve Rasner, the connection, and I, I was so excited. I was uh, took a minute to drop the starstruck, and I was like, okay, I'm going to talk to him. Anyway, let me give you some background. In, in 1989, he co-founded the Maddo Center for Dental Practice Success with the goal of helping his fellow dentists achieve success and happiness in their practice through personalized hands-on coaching. Having been a leader and dental consultant by Dentistry Today, for many years running, running his publications, articles, and blogs, and some of the most popular in the dental profession have reached over 100,000 practices across the world. Known for his hilarious and spontaneous spot, which I can I can vouch for, Rich has presented to standing room crowds practically every major city in the United States and Canada, teaching dentists and team mentors how to enjoy their careers, supercharge their practices, define and create their own personal success increase profitability, which everybody loves, and have more fun than ever before. He's the co-founder of TBSE. It's a groundbreaking dental show that challenged the way dental meetings were structured, providing an exciting and entertaining event for the entire team. Now, I asked him, too, to bring his guitar, but I, I don't know if he did. But he's, 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 he was hysterical. When I saw him, it was, it was a hysterical show, but it was very helpful. And I still remember those pearls from that time up in Buffalo. On a personal level, Rich is a lifelong and award-winning musician. Well, there you go. Songwriter and has performed in many venues across North America. His music can be found on Spotify, Apple Music, and all of the regular streaming sites. Among his other achievements, Rich's book, Is Your Frog Boiling, <laughs> was an Amazon.com bestseller, bestseller and has traveled to 57 countries. Let's t welcome our guest today, Dr. Richard Mano. Rich, how you yeah. doing, man? The future of fee-for-service dentistry is based in membership patients. If you need help starting your membership plan, or if your plan is too big for your team to manage, 
Visit dentalmembershipdirect.com to set up your free membership growth solution demo with our team. What a nice intro. Did my mom write that? that was I, it must have been. It was nice. It was good. <laughs> it's oh, great to good. be here, Sonny. Thanks so much, man. I love what you're doing. Your podcast is great. I just listened to your interview with Steve Rasner, or Raz, as I call him. And he's, he's such a good guy, such wisdom. Um, so congrats on what you're doing, man. Thank you. I mean, how about free and sharing? How about open, huh? He's like an open book. He is. He really is. Yep. And, and that's he was a, a speaker at our TBSC seminar many times and always just got a standing ovation. And when he walked off the stage, people were huddled around him like Paul McCartney just left the stage. So great guy. And, uh, you know, and that's I, I'm thinking, you know, if there's if that's an indication as to how good your podcast is, I want to be on it. So thanks so much for having me. Well, thanks for reaching out. I appreciate it. Now, I got to tell you, I don't know if I ever, ever told you this, but um the way I the way I met Steve, and he doesn't even realize it, was I had written an article, first and only article I ever wrote. I think it was published in Dentistry Today, the big one, right? And it was about, uh, at the time, Sally McKenzie was getting involved with American Dental Partners, and, and they were presenting, and they were purchasing, and they wanted, and I was sitting in a classroom of people at Kit Weathers' end of root camp, right? <laughs> And and they were just looking across the room, picking off the older guys who they could talk to. And I, I was so turned off by it. I, I just I wrote an article, and uh, a friend of mine, Doctor Wall in, in uh, Delaware, helped me out with some of the structure because I just wasn't good at it. And uh, when I write it, and sure enough, Steve Rasner calls my office and reaches out, says, "Hey, I just wanted to talk to you. A great article, great opinions." And then I was like, "Wait a second. This is a dude that's in the article. He's in all the time. This is a big time guy. I mean, like, I know his whole story about Jersey and low income and how he's. I'm like, I'm, I, I was flabbergasted. Never came back up till we got a connection to interview him. And I was like, man, you had a major effect on my career. So, all oh, good. that is so cool. I, I'd love to see that article too. It sounds great. Yeah. And Kid Weathers, Root Camp, and Pat Wall. You're bringing up some great. Pat names. Wall. That's it. Yeah. Pat, I couldn't remember his first yeah. name. Yeah, that was it. What a great guy. He he yeah. was at the camp. He was at the Root Camp. That's where he and I made a connection and uh, mm-hmm. developed a nice little friendship. What a great guy. Excellent. So let's talk. So talk, give us uh, just so our listeners who may have never heard from you. If they've never heard of you, they live under a rock and they don't really <laughs> live in the United States. But how did you get involved in dentistry? Tell us a little bit of how you got into it. Wow. Okay. I, I, I'm assuming you mean how I got involved in becoming a speaker, writer, coach, consultant, all those things. No. So getting involved in dentistry was maybe the same way everybody else does it. Um, you know, I was in college at University of Maryland in the 70s and um, didn't know what to do with my life. And for some reason, like many of us, just had a knack for doing well in science courses so that was cool i you know i knew i could do this um i have two older brothers both one was just graduated dental school the other was in dental school so it was kind of okay. a family thing as well and then my grandfather papa paul as we called him who actually lived to 106 he was a remarkable guy that's awesome um he was a general surgeon you know back in the day when he would go to people's houses and deliver babies and cut yeah. them open and all that kind of stuff um, and he loved his career as a physician, but he said it was a very stressful life. His always being called on weekends, and yeah. he'd be with my grandma at the opera, and they they'd stop the show and say, "Is Dr. Paul Shanker in the house?" And he would have to leave. And that part he didn't like so much. And one of his best buddies was a dentist, and he really admired the dental lifestyle. And I think he used to talk to us a lot about that when we were kids, because it was pretty obvious we were all going to go into some kind of science related field. Huh. Um, so I think he was a, a major influence on that. But I don't know. Your I dad? Mean, I, what was your dad? dad was, what was into? He was a shoe manufacturer, kind of a, I hate to say small time, because he, he was pretty successful. But he had a small shoe factory in Baltimore, in a real blue-collar section of Baltimore. And um, that was not the life for me. I used to work for him sometimes over the summers. And um, I knew that I did not want to be involved in any kind of manufacturing or retail or something where you've got so many things to look after and so much pressure. And it, that was just, that was not for me. But a little entrepreneurial spirit, I would imagine. 
Absolutely. Very much so. My mom's an entrepreneur. She's still around. She's 88. She's had a number of businesses. She still works. Um, she she runs Mahjong tournaments, if you even know what that is. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a card game, right? It's kind of like cars, but it's with these little tiles. Um, ah, and she, yes. she owns a, some retail stores. She, I mean, when I was a kid, she would go door to door selling wigs, um, Avon. She just, I, I think she knew everything about running a small business except how to turn a profit. Um, but it was just kind of always in our blood, I guess, to do something fun, do something you love, be your own boss. Um, that's like a perfect then, storm. That's, that's like the yeah, great creation I, of. Of, of a wedding with with dentistry from your grandfather telling you about you know being the professional and having this lifestyle and now having this little bit of business background that probably at the dinner table you probably had some pretty nice dinners pretty good conversations yeah the, the food wasn't that great but the conversations were always good <laughs> and then uh you know i became a dentist and then somehow morphed into this dentist who was getting out of the office and traveling around and meeting all kinds of just great people. I, dentists are the coolest. I always love meeting and chatting with dentists and team members. Um, it's been so much fun being out of the operatory for so many years. So it's it's been great. So what, what, it was what was it the Maddow report? What was your first? Um, what was your first uh, newsletter? Good memory. It was, it was called it was called the Richards Report. Richards Report. Um, that was Richards it. Report. For that those of it. you who don't know what that was. This was in the day when you could have a newsletter and sell it for a premium price, kind of like being a fee-for-service dentist. Yeah. I mean, if you had great information, people Which would you pay did. a price for it, and they saw yeah. the value in it. The Richards Report was a black and white, 12 to 16-page newsletter. It looked like it was banged out. Well, it was, actually, um, before we got computerized, banged out on an old typewriter. And it was a different era. that you know Social media didn't exist, so opinions like radical opinions or contrary opinions from dentists were really hard to come by because the throwaway journals dental economics whatever i mean they were great but they were advertiser supported so you couldn't really say anything in them you know you couldn't give a bad review to a product right. you couldn't say insurance companies suck uh, you right. couldn't use you know shady language or tell the real story about what it was like being in, in the trenches dentist and I think mm -hmm. the Richards Report was the first publication that did that. Um, yeah, and it, like it hands on, fun. like hands on. Hey, I'm using this. Here's a technique, and you know, if you save, let's say you save a doc uh, on a procedure he does five times a day, and you save him ten minutes on each procedure. He just found basically an hours of time, one hour a time, which is worth a ton of money, as most people will know in private practice. And I remember that I got turned on to it late. But I did, I did get turned on to the Richards report, so I, I thought it was tremendous. You know, it, oh, it was, so it was really liked it. from the heart. Yeah. It's funny. I I never claimed to be an expert clinician. Um, you know, I I treated my patients well. I did good dentistry, but I never, I was, was never like you know Bill Strop or or those guys. But um, I think the most comments, positive comments, out of any clinical thing I ever published, and we morphed into management. I really got out of talking about clinical but um i don't even remember what it was called the laminar impression technique where you you drill holes in the side of the triple tray and inject the wash in there that was so cool and i mean it was nobody was talking about that you couldn't publish that in a real clinical journal you get you know you, you get blown away by by the ivory tower folks um but yeah those kind of tips really worked and saved a lot of time and i'm, I'm so glad that you appreciate it that was great and 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 the next part, right? The next phase. So, so talk about that. Well, let me ask you, what was the genesis of the thought to start doing that? To start doing the Richards report. What, what was it to oh. say, listen, Hey, let's, let's start doing this and let's put it out there. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you the kind of the origin story of our whole business. I'll try to make it really quick. Um, sure. I graduated dental school in 1984 I uh, did an incredible GPR in Miami Beach at Mount Sinai Medical Center. So that I felt like I was really well-trained. But, you know, as you know, no matter how well-trained you feel like you are, when you get out in the real world, you don't know a damn thing. You don't know what's going on. Kind of like when you get your driver's license, you just hope you don't kill anyone for the first five years. And that's what it's like being a young dentist. And I had, my, you know, my share of 
horrible, crappy associateships like everyone else. <laughs> um, finally, the last one was a real, real high volume, blue collar extraction indenture type practice, which was fine with me. I mean, I learned a ton about practicing efficiently and treating patients well and doing all those things. But the owner was kind of old school and I felt like I was the smart young guy. And maybe I overreached a little bit trying to suggest some changes in the practice one day, um, really pissed him off. We got into a little argument. And I got to work the next day. And this was truly like an old school blue collar practice. So every morning, patients in pain will be lined up at the door of the practice. So who was ever first in would greet these you know, three or four people in line with towels wrapped around their heads. It was awesome. It was, it was just a scene. Um, and, you know, you open the door and let them in and say, have a seat. We're going to get to you as soon as we can, blah, blah, whatever. So the day after the argument, I was the first one in. And I went to open the door of the practice and my key didn't work. And I'm like, I'm thinking, is the key jammed? And all these patients are looking at me. And I realized the guy fired me, but it was too much of a wimp to actually do it. So we had a locksmith come in in the middle of the night. <laughs> so I couldn't enter the office. <laughs> and I just looked at these poor people and said, I don't know what's going on. Let me go try to straighten this out, knowing that I was canned. Um, I, you know, I went to a McDonald's and cried to my egg McMuffin trying to get my life together and actually just started kind of almost enjoying my unemployment and making a strategy and figure, you know, this associateship's not for me. I got to own my own practice. What am I going to do? And I started meeting people and learning and learning. I was driving around the suburbs of Baltimore with them from Baltimore, still live in Baltimore. And, and I would always like go up to a dental practice and try to introduce myself and, and, you know, meet the dentist and say, maybe there's, you know, partnership position here possible. And I met a ton of dentists and, um, you know, knocking on doors, you can really learn a lot. And I saw this dental practice in a cool area and it actually had, people don't believe these stories when I tell them, but I swear they're true. It actually had a sign on the door of a functioning dental practice that said dental office for sale which was a little weird. And I went and I met the owner. It was a struggling, near bankrupt practice. I, I bought it for a tiny amount, kind of took on the debt, and that became my first practice. And I, I worked hard and got creative, learned the ropes, and after a few years, turned it into a, a mega successful practice with associates. And it was just so much fun. Well, you know what's funny is everybody's story, right? And you just think about it, like, you know, Howard Fran, he, he starts from scratch. He's knocking on people's doors, getting patients, you know. You're going around, driving around, looking at office to office. Hey, can 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 I help you? Can I work for you? And you, <laughs> you I can't even picture it, but I'm trying to. Dental office for sale. Like, you, so you walked, up, you walked up to an office that's got this sign. You must have thought, wow, well, this might work out because that's really ultimately what you wanted. You wanted your own practice. Could you imagine just, being the patient coming in that day and there's a sign that says that a lot of this for sale? It's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I better get in before he leaves. Exactly. Or not. Take the towel. As, as Take the, the case towel was. Off my cheek. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so that's your start. That's an amazing start. Now, your other brothers, what were they doing? Because they were ahead of you, right? Was it both of the brothers yeah. ahead of you? So I have two brothers. They're older than me. Marshall is the middle brother. He was only a year ahead of me. So he was still in the early stages of his career as well. Um, Dave, my older brother, who wound up being my partner in the Matter Center, um, was kind of four years ahead in every way. He did the same path, dental school residency, crappy associateships. But he started a partnership practice from scratch with zero patients and two mouths to feed, so to speak. So that was just as scary, if not scarier, than what I did. But by the time I was at this stage in my career, this early stage, he had already seen some success. He had a really nice practice with a great guy who was his partner, and they were starting to grow their practice too. And um, I'll kind of, if you don't mind, kind of morph into the story of how we started our path yeah. of teaching other dentists. Yeah. Um, Dave and I actually lived on the same street, which was weird. There was one house between us. I think they hated us because we were constantly, you know, traipsing yeah. across his front lawn. But yeah, we that was in your way. Exactly, Joel Swearing, get that guy out of here. Yeah, no kind of guts to the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever happened to you? Um, <laughs> so many nights after the kids were in bed, we both had young kids at the time. We'd go to one another's house or sit on the back porch or whatever and just talk about things in our dental practice, what was going on, what went well, what didn't go well. 
And um, one thing that we were talking about one night was just how it really angered us. And this was still kind of the remnants of the drill, fill, and bill days. We weren't that sophisticated in our sure. financial policies yet. Um, one of the things that just really bummed us out was when patients didn't pay. I mean, you know, that's a pretty bad scene, right? We would do great treatment for a patient, give it our all, and they might pay 50% of the you know first visit or whatever, but then they didn't pay. We said, this is not acceptable. Let's do something about this. I guess we weren't smart enough at the time to realize we should be making them pay up front. So we actually developed this collection form called the Statement of Delinquency Form. Um, and we used it in our practices. It was very striking. It had big red letters that said Statement of Delinquency. It was two parts, like a, the top copy and then the yellow copy underneath, where if you wrote it, with a pen or a typewriter or bleed through, you know, the look, and you'd mail it in the window envelope and it would look very threatening and patients paid. It was, we called it the magic form. We would send this form to our patients and they'd come in the next day, cash or check or credit card in hand saying, oh, please don't you know, do anything. I don't want to ruin my credit report, whatever. And they would pay instantly. So we shared it with some of our friends who were dentists and they loved it. They all reported the same thing. And we said, wow, this is really cool. We developed this form. This is neat. Right. Um, a few months later, we're at the beach, Rehoboth Beach, which is, you know, one of the big um, oh, Atlantic well. Ocean beaches here. Yeah, you know, okay, you know Rehoboth. Oh, well. um, and our, our wives sent us up to get some sunscreen. So Dave and I, walk, we're walking the boardwalk. We wind up in this little beer bar. And we're saying, you know what? This statement of delinquency thing, this is pretty cool. Maybe we can start a little side business or side hustle, as they call it today, right. yeah. selling this to other dentists. We did a business plan on a napkin. I mean, this is all so cliche, but it's really, really true. Did a business plan on a napkin, rented a P.O. box, and started learning the direct mail business, how to write a sales letter, you know, strategies right. for all that stuff, and, and started this little business. Um, invested a very small amount of money and did a tiny mailing to dentists and people were buying our collection forms. And if we made some profit, which we did, we would pull that into larger and larger and larger mailings. And before long, maybe six months time, we had about 30,000 customers across the U.S. using our collection forms. And we would meet every Monday at the mailbox and it would be stuffed with checks. It was the coolest feeling. And this little business was born. So that led to some notoriety. And you asked about the Richards Report, which is kind of a long way around telling you the story. Um, but eventually, Dental Economics contacted me and said, hey, it looks like you've got some expertise in collections. Can you write an article for us? I wrote an article. It was actually about, um, the article was actually about, should a new patient see the dentist or the hygienist on their first visit? So this was many, many years ago. And they said the article was great and it was well received. And we loved it, and here's your, your check for $50 for submitting this article. I thought, well, you know, maybe there's a better way. So Dave and I just had the idea, let's start our own newsletter. We can say anything. We can charge whatever we want. And kind of the same way that we learned the direct mail business through the collection forms, we did this with the Richards Report newsletter. And then that led to you know so many other things, lecture opportunities and um, more articles and Eventually, our big Vegas seminar, personalized coaching, blah, 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 blah. I tried to cram a long history into a few minutes, but that's really how the whole ball got rolling. It's, I love this. I love this stuff. I love the story. And, and it can so, it's so relatable because everybody thinks it's easy, right? Oh, I just want to sell, like, you know, these side hustles. I see these postings all the time online, like, yeah, I'm just going to start this and start that. And I, I remember one thing that I was taught and I never forgot it. And I think, I don't know if it was Howard Coran or if it was Kit or someone said it. People in dentistry make mistakes when they try to invest in things that are not dentistry because they think because I'm good at this. So true. I'm going to be good at that. Like I'm going to own a sports bar. No, no, what the hell do you know about sports bar? Right. <laughs> but what you did was you took parts of dentistry section them out and made you know different pathways but it was reliant upon really your your profession and your knowledge in that area so makes sense you know sonny I, I i so agree and there's an old kind of southern expression that i love that says the same thing and that's dance with who brung you right and, you know for dentist dentistry brung us this is where our knowledge is if you want to get out of clinical dentistry a day or two a week do something in dentistry. I, I love the sports bar that you said, because 
so many times the dentist was, I'm going to, you know, my nephew's got a brew pub. I'm going right. to invest in the sports bar. And what do you do? You're up till two in the morning. You think it's going to be fun the first two nights and it sucks and they don't make any money and you're drained and it's, and then you wind up just writing off the investment and going back to your practice. So I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. So tell me now, take, take your business then. And now this, I want to hear a little bit about the TVSE and the dental, the dental shows, the dental, the, the, tell, tell us about the dental show. Well, the TBSC, we don't do anymore. We retired it after 25 years. But okay. TBSC was a, a large multi-speaker meeting that Dave and I held in Las Vegas. Um, it was so weird. One day, we're both big music fans. I'm a musician. Um, Dave knows a ton about music. So we would always go to concerts together. Uh -huh. um, and one day, we're sitting in a dental seminar together. And we're just thinking, this is so effing boring. Boring. Or, yeah. Why why can't a dental seminar be as fun as a concert? I mean, there are so many great speakers in dentistry, yet dental seminars were still just boring. So we kind of came up with this idea. It was based on a direct marketing seminar we attended in Las Vegas. And that would be have professional sound and lighting and bring in the best speakers you can possibly find, but don't have breakout sessions, not multiple rooms. Everything's in one room. Every speaker gets one hour. It's a greatest hit show. Nobody's doing a half day or a full day. Um, and then we're going to just make it exciting. And we didn't know what the heck we were doing. So we, we, we booked a hotel conference room in Baltimore, at the Sheraton, downtown Baltimore, 300 seats. We were already friends with a bunch of people who you mentioned. Um, Kit Weathers, Howard Ferran were all at our very first. Um, we called it the Richards Report Fall Seminar in those days. They were at our very first one. It sold out instantly. It was unbelievable. We And we did our creative fun videos, of music and dental parody songs. And after the first one said, you know what, we got to take this on the road to Vegas. That's where it's happening. And second year was at the Flamingo in Las Vegas. And it grew and grew and grew. After about five or six years, we had 3,000 attendees, 80 exhibitors. Um, it was just fun. We had some celebrity guests there. And somehow, I don't know how this happened, um, people started dressing in costumes. And I don't know if you've ever been to a TBSC. It's unfortunately, it's, it's gone. But um, we'd walk in the first day, and there'd be 3,000 dentists and team members wearing costumes of you know some were dental oriented some weren't they had like you know light up headbands it just was the most bizarre thing in the world it was so much fun um and fortunately after 25 years it was a ton of work i mean it was a year-round job and um it just became too risky signing these crazy contracts with the vegas hotel so after a while we just said we've had it um we retired right before covid hit which was the luckiest thing of mm -hmm. all time but it was a blast. And I met so many great dentists and team members and speakers and KOLs. It was just great. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I, I, it's legendary. There's no doubt about it. I remember seeing a lot of references to it and a lot of people that spoke there. So let's morph into a little bit of the, we talk, we're going to talk a little bit about memorable patient experiences, but I do want to ask you one question about what was your business model in practice? Were you in network? Were you out of network? What what, what was your mindset yeah. there? It's a it's a great question. And again, you know, I started my practice. It was totally a different era. Um, yeah. And, you know, HMOs were like the big the big nuisance in those days. Um, yep. And and there was something worse than an HMO. Oh, capitation. Capitation. That was, capitation. That was, that was for devil, capitation. Capitation, right. So, you know, kind of the modern equivalent of, of PPOs and other things we're faced with today. And I remember I started the practice. I, you know, I bought a bankrupt practice. We didn't have any patients. So um, I can't even remember if they were participating in plans or not. It wouldn't have mattered. But as I'm formulating my business plan, you know, the, you know how it is when you're the new guy, the local specialist, I'll take you out to lunch. And I would always ask my local specialist, how do I deal with this? You know, all these, you know, the PPOs and the you know, HMOs and the capitation plans are knocking on my door promising me the world and you know every month this big capitation check is going to come in the mail and it's going to be great and blah 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 so i asked them their opinion and i remember um i had two orthodontists that i worked with i thought they were both great and one of them said to me you know rich you're young you don't have any patience yet um 
I would recommend taking every plan you can you can handle. Take every plan. You can always drop them later as you get more successful. And the second orthodontist said, you know, Rich, this is a big decision because if you decide to get involved with these plans now, it's going to become your lifestyle. It's going to become your niche. You're, it's going to be impossible to drop them without severely defining your path. Yeah, exactly. And I'm thinking, well, both of these guys are smart. Right. You know, they're both saying what they feel is right for them. I'm sure there are successful models that have followed either of these pieces of advice. Right. Right. But what what do I want? What do I yeah. want? I want to spend time with my patients. Um, you know, I want to do the best treatment possible, not have them say, what, what are my restrictions that insurance is going to F me over with? Um, and the capitation was the worst because worst. you actually would do better if your patients didn't come in. With you, you were encouraged to not see the patient. Right. Something in this, this is my career. This is going to be my life. This is my practice. I'm going to take path B, which the second orthodontist suggested. And I was not involved with, you know, crappy insurance plans. I think I'm looking way, way back. There was one plan that we weren't forced to take, but they represented like all the, it might have been all the nurses and staff at a nearby hospital. And it wasn't that bad. So I decided to take that one. Um, so I wasn't 100% fee for service, but I was mostly fee for service. Right. And it continued that way. Yeah, that's a, that, you know, it's interesting because that was my kind of my story. I went into a practice as an associate, and that was, the prevailing thought amongst our dental community, not just, you know, small segments, but most of the dentists enjoyed that type of practice. And they would always say they can't exist without your license, you know? So those forms and those plans and those companies that come in and they, they rely on fear. They go and they say, well, if you don't take it, the guy down the street's going to take it and you're going to go out of business, you know? So we were like, listen, if we just, they, in communication with each other because we're not in competition with each other that was the prevailing thought it's changed a lot since then but back then that was a prevailing thought and handled it from a more of a business standpoint you know? so are you saying you actually banded together with your local dentist and just all refused to take the worst plans no i can't say that but i can say this the dental society would not allow that to be discussed so they formed a they formed a, a new uh, group. It was a dental foundation that you had to pay into. And then you could, underneath that banner, you could have those conversations. And and always it was like, understand what you're signing, understand they can't exist without your license, and understand this is their methodology, right? So it was just really spreading information. It didn't say don't, but I think if you were... <laughs> grammar school education you could figure it out pretty quick right like this okay. is cracking me up I, I remember i was in a, a great study club really great group of dentists and one time we just started discussing our fees and like one guy said we're not allowed to discuss our fees that's collusion i'm thinking like okay i don't know anybody who's in jail for collusion for discussing their crown fee but you know maybe technically you're right but, yeah that was the fear too it's collusion yeah so funny so moving into so so you developed your pre, your practice philosophy very early, which is important, I think. Now talk about like how that relates to our topic, which is creating memorable patient experiences. Yeah, great, great thing. Um, you know, I as I said, I don't teach clinical dentistry. Um, I teach management, or I, I don't even like that term, practice management. I, I teach the business side, the non-clinical side of dentistry, and. You know, this topic always comes up. How do we maintain a fee-for-service practice? How do we get rid of our PPOs? What do we say to a patient who's in network but we're not? These questions always come up. And I think it basically comes down to how do you have a practice where patients will willingly come there knowing that it might be a little bit more expensive or even worse, knowing if they're in network, they might have the whole hassle of paying your whole fee and getting reimbursed 60% of it. And if it's not... It's not convenient. People don't want to do that. So how do we make a practice where they'll actually want to come to us, even given, given those circumstances? And I think, and I don't know how much clinical stuff you get into on your podcast, or I hope I'm not offending anyone now, but I think a lot of dentists think, well, the answer to that question means that I'm going to have 
the most clinically sophisticated practice. I'm going to have the, you know, cone beam x-rays. I'm going to have the CEREC machine. I'm going to do sedation. I'm going to do implants, which all those things are great. I mean, I would never say not to do that. Those are all fabulous. But I feel like to the, from the patient's point of view, you've got to just provide an experience that they can't get at the dentist office down the street. You've got to make them feel like I'm paying a little bit more and it's worth every penny. And that, you know, that could be the place you get your hair cut. It could be why you go to a farm to table restaurant instead of Applebee's. It's the same thing. People are willing to pay a little bit more for an incredible experience. And, you know, the good news is it's not hard to do. And the second piece of good news is, let's admit it, the bar in dentistry for providing a great patient experience is pretty darn low. So if you can just do a few things to make that patient feel unbelievably special, to me, that is the most important step in having a practice that's fee-for-service where people willingly come to you knowing it may cost them a bit more. I, my, one of my favorite things that I heard someone say was, you know, quality, service, price, pick two, right? And in the fee-for-service world, you're not really going to compete on price. You know, and you may, you, you may we want to be in the realm of what some of the others charge, but I don't think you're going to win that battle, but you should win the quality and the service. I, I agree with right. that. So, and, and I think you can't give enough service. Totally. And the thing about fees or pricing is dentistry is expensive. I mean, we know it's worth every penny and more, but it's expensive. I mean, there, there's just no way getting around that. Um, so if you're not taking the plans and you're not advertising, you're doing crowns for 600 bucks, right. the patients are going to think it's expensive. If your crown's 1800 or if it's 1600, they're exactly. going to think it's expensive. So you may as well have the fee that will allow you to spend time with your patients and give the amazing experience. It's, it's funny. I remember a uh, a lecturer, and I'm, I'm gonna, it might have been Linda Miles. It could have been Jennifer D. St. George. It was one of those two. And they were talking about that point that you just said there. And they said, well, you know, our crown our crown fee is $1,200. And the patient's like, oh, our crown fee is $1,000. Oh, now both of them seem high. And the only common denominator is the word dollars. <laughs> it's a, a thousand or 1200 Like, that's the bottom line. Like, you know, it's it's going to be seen as expensive, and right, so you true. You have to, but you have to talk about right the value and and the and and, and what you're going to do. So let's talk talk about what do you think are the key points of providing that memorable patient experience? Ah, well, the first thing is you always have to remember. Um, I'm sure some of your listeners have read the books or the main book by Dr. Robert Cialdini. Um, PhD professor emeritus, I think at Arizona State, who studied the art of persuasion. How do we get people to do what we want them to do? I think his big first big hit book was called Persuasion, um, ethically, of course. But how do we get people to do what we want them to do? And the number one, he lists a bunch of factors, but the number one factor is reciprocity. And I think this is where dentists need to start. And that is, we want our patients to do things such as, we know what we want our patients to do. Um, refer others, show up on time, pay for their treatment, pay our fees that might be a little bit higher. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we want them to do all these great things, but they're not going to do that unless it starts with us. It's reciprocity. We've got to show them that we are making them feel important, making them feel special, showing them our office is the greatest thing ever. So all these things we want our patients to do begins with us providing this incredible memorable experience. So I can talk about a few things if you like. I don't know if we have that much time yeah. to go through. You know, I, I do a full day on providing a memorable sure patient do. experience. Um, let's just start with the first visit, okay? Yeah. The magical the magical first visit. Um, I'm a big believer that when a patient calls your practice, a potential new patient, you've got to get them in right away. I say within 48 hours of initial contact. You know, it used to be this big, you know, people would brag at the local study club, oh, I'm so busy, I can't get a new patient in for yes. eight weeks. So, yeah. You know, good for you, but your practice is not growing and you're turning down patients. So I always had dedicated new patient time on my schedule. So when a new patient calls, we get them in within 48 hours, or at least we're able to offer them an appointment. 
within 48 hours, without question, all the time. Boom. That's step number one to the new patient visit. Um, I'll just go through a bunch of things that are just popping into my head. That new patient comes in, and I can say this as a dental consultant slash coach. I'm not sure what the difference is, but I, I use both terms interchangeably. Who it depends actually, on what, 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 what era, right? Now it's coach. Used to be right, consultant. right, right. Or yeah. who you're trying to appeal to or whatever. <laughs> you probably like coach better, isn't it? I love coach, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I've sat in the reception areas of hundreds, I don't know, thousands of practices. And I just can't believe that a new patient walks in, you know, their very first second in this practice, and they're treated with such a ho-hum attitude. You know, maybe somebody slides that ugly frosted glass thing, oh, Oh, uh, who are you? Uh, fill this out. It's like, yeah. and that's no exaggeration, man. You've got a new patient on the schedule. You know their name. You know, they they fill out all their stuff ahead of time. So you pretty much know their name, their age. You know, this person who you've never seen before walks in the door. You know who it is, right? This is not a mystery. So stand up, get out to the reception area, say, oh, you must be sunny. Welcome to the practice. And shake their hand. And don't say, here, fill all this bullshit out. Just treat them like you want to be treated. We're so happy to see you. Thanks so much for choosing our practice. And then say what I I call are the magic words. The magic words that a new patient loves to hear. I always ask this in my my seminars. I'll say, now we're going to say the magic words. What are the magic words to a new patient that's just walked in your office? And everybody raises their hand. And everybody says something that's great. You know, welcome to our practice. Thanks so much for trusting us. Use their name, all those things, and they're all great. But to me, and use all those things, but to me, the real magic words that will impress a patient right away is to say, now you've got to back this up, but it's to say, don't even sit down. We're ready for you. Because running on time is so important. And again, talk about something that differentiates you. I mean, geez, you know, comedians make fun of how they have to wait at their dental appointment. So to me, after all the niceties, welcome to the practice. Thanks so much for choosing us. You call the patient by their name. If you can then say, don't even sit down, we're ready for you. And you bring them right back and get to it right away. Already you're providing an experience they've probably never had anywhere else. Fabulous. That's fabulous. I'll keep I'll keep talking now, about the first appointment if you like. But I just ahead. want I just I want you to know my daughter is a stand-up comedian, so she might be is using she really that is she, so cool. Might be using some of this, but she, is she in Manhattan? <laughs> she is, but she's actually moving to Los Angeles as a matter of fact today. Today's her flight out. That is so exciting. Yeah. Does she have stuff on YouTube? Yes, she does. Yeah. Erica. I'm check her out. Yeah. Erica. Hmm. Yeah. Erica Spear. Well, we're really getting off topic here. That is so yeah. exciting. And this is sorry, a sorry to go gig. there, but keep going. No, no, yeah, yeah, that's it's what great. she does. Yep. Oh, that is so cool. I, I want to talk to you offline about this. We won't we won't take up your podcast time, but that that's really exciting. Um yeah. my, my daughter's in the arts as well. And um, I mean it's a it's a, when your kids in the arts, it's it's a struggle for a parent mm-hmm. sometimes. But it's a um, hustle. Yeah, you gotta be so encouraging. And um, yeah. My daughter actually made it big. She's she's huge. She's a um a USA Today best-selling author. That's awesome. And yeah, she lives in the West Village and she's she gets the yeah. number one new release banner on Amazon all the time. So it's it's crazy when your kids want to do something artistic. Um okay, so now you've got this patient. You've taken Yeah, let's them keep back. going. Yeah, They're you brought them back. The what do most dentists do? They sit in that position like they're treating the patient where, you know, the patient's head is right there and it's very awkward and they're tilting that. When you're first talking to a patient, just take a second to slide your chair around so you're yeah. at their feet and looking at them like they're an actual human being. Knees and not to a knees. Mouth. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. And it kind of brings up something else too. Something I hate hearing, and I hear it in dental offices all the time, is when somebody will say, we've got a crown prep in room three. And it's like, you're going to walk in the room and there's just like a, a bombed out Big two. sitting in the chair, yeah. right? No, you've got a human being in there who has a name and a family and a career and feelings and a favorite band and a favorite sports team. And they just got back from a trip. You've got somebody in there who's a human being, not, and that's how we've got to remember to treat our patients. So 
You're that's, sitting that's, east and that's east. My, that's my one big complaint with dental schools. They put those loops on those those young dentists so quickly that they start to eliminate the human being immediately, almost immediately. You're focusing on that little white chiclet. Sorry, that's a pet so peeve. True. Keep, keep going. No, no, it's great. I, I love pet peeves. <laughs> I have too many of them. Drives me crazy, but anyway, go yeah, ahead. Right. Okay, so now, your knees to knees, as you said, that's a great expression right. of this patient. What do you talk about? Are you going to say, first, to start asking them about their dental needs? No. Take like one minute and have a little personal conversation with them. Um, you know, some people are so good at cocktail party, small talk. People yeah. assume that I am because I'm comfortable being on stage in front of 3,000 people, but I suck at it. I am not good at small talk. Um, so you got to have a little formula. Mine is F-O-R, family, occupation, recreation. Three things that most people are comfortable and love talking about, um, especially recreation. I love saying something to the patient, like, it's so great to meet you. I just want to learn a little bit about you. I know that you're, and I, this is kind of tongue in cheek, I'll say something like, I know your favorite thing in the world is to be in the dental office for your dental visit, but if you weren't here and you weren't at work, what would you love to be doing? And you will learn things about your patients and you'll learn cool things about your patients. I heard incredible stories about people who were mountain climbers. And I remember I had this grandma who told me she was the lead singer in a punk band in in. New York in the 70s, and you'll learn really cool things about people. And make notes. I call it the blue sheet. Always make personal notes. You can bring that up at their next visit. Now, don't keep bringing up the same thing every time. You got to update your blue sheet. But learn about these people as, as people. It doesn't take that much time. And it's so great to do during the first visit. And you've got to allow time on the schedule to do this. If you're feeling rushed all day long, you will not be able to do this. So it's just so important to know them as a person. And it takes a few minutes. And I know we keep talking, coming back to Raz, um, Razner, because he's one of my favorite dental guys. He always says that when he slowed his schedule down, he became much more productive. And it sounds counterintuitive, but it's so true. Yeah, he's also, his, his big thing, and, and it's also so important. I'm just starting to have a significant other with him. Yeah, that is a big thing. That's a tough in one. one room, right? So you're doing that? A tough one. I'm trying to. I mean, I'm trying. I'm like in my mind, I'm saying, "Oh, we need to start to do this because if we're going to have a conversation about ultimately their dental care or their oral health, we need. <laughs> if it's a guy, we need a decision maker. <laughs> we need the woman in there. <laughs> we all know who that is, <laughs> right? We know who it is. Let's let's be honest, right? Let's yeah. let's not play footsie here. That's who needs to be here, you know. But it does it does uh, elevates the conversation and it brings another person in and you can you know engage there as well. Uh, how do you uh, how do you take um, how do you take the data or the information? For example, like a medical history person hasn't filled it out in the first time in your office. Do you do uh, that after you've had your introduction? What do you do? It's a it's a great question. Well, first of all, I mean these days you know most people fill it out online and you have it ahead right. of time. Um, back in the old days. I would have a team member personally take the medical history and review the medical history with them. And that's something that I learned in my residency, that you can have somebody fill out a form, but you're going to get so much more information if there's actually human interaction. And um, it's funny, I did my residency in Miami Beach, so I had to learn medical and dental Spanish in order to do yeah. this. So I was yeah. fluent in taking a history and physical, not just dental, but medical in Spanish. Um, and I don't remember any of it. The only phrase I remember is respire profundo y espacio por la nariz, por favor. Breathe deeply and slowly through your nose, which you had to say when the patient got all, all hyperventilated. But um, again, it's so important because, you know, a patient says something and there's many times a good follow-up question and you're not going to get that in the handwritten form. So again, these are things where you have to slow down and spend time and know that it's going to take a, a team member or you, you know, five, 10 extra minutes to take a medical history. I actually liked it when a, a female would take a woman's medical history because, you know, I, I, I would be asking questions that maybe some females didn't think a dentist had any business knowing, let alone a male. Um, so I just thought it worked out great. And then, of course, if there's anything I needed to talk to the patient about personally, I would do that as well. But it's an interesting question, Sonny, because I think most people don't think about that. 
they just have the patient fill out a form and boom, it's all over. Mm -hmm. So, so you have, you've initiated, you're using your FOR, you have that conversation. Now, how do you, how do you work into why they're here? How do you have that next up? I, my, my opening question, I don't even know if it's a great one or not. Um, just always work well for me. I would just say, what can we help you with today? Sure. I think for 50% of the dentists, the next thing they say is open, please, which just sucks. Um, mm -hmm. I like open-ended questions. I don't like yes or no questions. I just have always had good luck with what can we help you with today? But what was yours? Or so what, what's your opening question? So you're opening. Yeah. Question. Yeah. That would be it. Like, or what brought you in today? You know, like, uh -huh. you know, what, what can we help you with? You know? Um, yeah, especially once you, once you engage them in that. So, you know, tell me why you're here, you know, tell me what we right. can do for you, you know? And that's another thing too, whether it's, you know, some version of that, what brought you in, what yeah. can we help you with today? Tell me why you're here. Always works better if you spend a few minutes to do the personal questions sure. first. It just kind of warms them up, kind of the warm up act, like your daughter's yeah. going to have when she goes to LA and she's headlining yeah. the comedy cellar. Um, yeah. <laughs> comedy cellar. It's funny you say that because that's who she contracts with now in New York. So no kidding, that's yeah. so cool. And she's been Vegas a couple times. I don't I've know. Seen so much comedy in the village. I, I right? wonder if I have. That's that's so cool. So so in engaging them. Right. And the next step of why they're here to me, if you if you've got some information, you can relate some of that. So if the person tells you that obviously, OK, take the mountain climber, active lifestyle, travels, and they've got a major issue, you can say, oh, so something like this could really slow down these other things that you enjoy doing. Or you could be in a situation where this can blow up on you and you're not accessible to care. So, you know, it's, it's very personalized. Now their treatment plan for them, just like if you're a car mechanic and the person comes in and you don't know anything about them, you're just going to look at the car. But if you're like, you know, do you drive off and, you know, do you use your car for your business. Okay. You know, are you capable of fixing? No. Okay. So your car is really important and you need it. Okay. So, what I'm hearing is this, but what I'm seeing are a couple other things that could become an issue and put you in harm's way. And now they're like, oh, geez. Yeah. It, it's, it's so trust them to who they are, and what they need. Right. Oh, you've yeah. got an Alfa Romeo. Here's my cell phone number. Um, but I, I think <laughs> what you're saying is so true. And it, I know it's almost a cliche that, oh, you've got a wedding coming up because, you know, how often does that happen? But we always use that in our lectures as an example. But but it just goes to what you're saying if you can weave their personal life into their dental needs in a positive way, it's so great. Let's get you a beautiful smile for that wedding. Um, There's a once in a lifetime event, yeah. that high school reunion, that job interview, or like you said, the mountain climber, you don't want to be stuck on the top of whatever. I can't think mm -hmm. of the name of a mountain on top of Mount Rainier yeah. and have this tooth blow up on you. Let's get it taken care of once and for all. Or even if it allows you to ask the question, you know, how do you feel about some of these things? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly, uh, you know, I'm terribly afraid of this happening. Okay. So you're telling me you want to focus highly on prevention so that you don't go into pain, abscess, swelling, major issues. So we're going to, we're going to focus our treatment plan in this fashion. Here. So true. I, I'm coming here because I had a horrible experience with another dentist. I had a root canal and it was so painful. Let's make sure that never happens again by by the right prevention. Yeah, I, I love the way you're doing that. You're weaving the patient's story into their dental treatment. Yeah, or, or asking them, right? Just asking them yeah. to share that with you. And then, okay, I, I see that that means a lot to you. Well, then I'm going to point out some things that are here and now issues and some things that are going to be now or later issues. And you can choose how you want to go about fixing them. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um Okay, so now something I, I love doing during the exam is um, making the exam, I call it the informative exam. And some people, some dentists look at me like I'm an idiot when I say this. <laughs> they just think it's silly. But the informative exam means that along with doing your secret language with, the, with your assistant, you know, let's yeah. face it, number three, MOD amalgam is secret language. Sure. Uh, we need to have accurate record keeping, of course, so that's it's needed. But I also do the exam in English 
so the patient can understand it. And it just leads to them. You can see the light bulb going off in their head. And one of my favorite examples is the periodontal exam. Um, the patient has no idea what's going on during the periodontal exam. They're sitting there. They're feeling a little jab every now and then. And they're hearing three, two, three, three, two, three, three, two, three, three, two, five. Ha <laughs> ha, good one. Three, two, three. And it's like, what is going on here? It sounds like, you know, the old uh, IBM Fortran yeah. programming or something has taken place. Um so I just like to humanize the exam and using the perio exam as an example, say something like, um, now we're going to check the health of your gums. And you may not know this, but more adults lose teeth due to inflammation and infection in their gums than any other reason. Everybody thinks it's cavities or you know this or that, but having healthy gums is the key thing for an adult to keep their teeth the rest of their lives. And that's why we pay really close attention to this. Now to do the exam, we're going to check to see how tightly your gums are attached to their to your teeth. Now, is this 100% clinically accurate? I stay close enough. We're going to check to see how tightly your gums are attached to your teeth. And we use this little ruler. And the ruler is measured in millimeters. And when you hear a low number, like a one or a two or a three, that's usually a sign that your gums are nice and tightly attached, and that's a healthy area. If you hear a higher number, like a four or a five, that could be a sign of inflammation and infection. So boom, now you're doing this perio exam and you better believe that patient is listening. And when they mm -hmm. hear a four or a five or a six, they're thinking, wow, I hope the dentist or the hygienist is gonna talk to me about how to fix this. So I love human, and same thing with the heart tissue exam. You know, tooth number three, the upper right first molar has a large three surface metal and mercury filling it looks like it's really old and oh i can i can get the instrument between the tooth and the filling there's a little crack in there and i can feel the decay and bacteria underneath again i do the exam so the patient knows what's going on not so it's a big miss i actually heard a, a lecturer one time say your goal is to keep the patient in as, as much mystery as possible and then spill all your beans during the treatment plan presentation i thought that's silly that doesn't work. It's high pressure, high stress. I like to be really open with the patients about everything. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing that was, what's that? What was it? Omer Reed was it, right? Was it co-diagnosis, right? It, yeah. You're evolving, you're evolving that patient in their own care. And that's, that's a concept that medicine has no idea what that means. Oh God, that's great. But, sure. <laughs> but in dentistry, you know, it's essential. Yep, it is. And, and I think we also have to realize that as much as we know dentistry is so valuable and contributes to not just health, but mental well-being and everything, just about everything we do is elective. I mean, people say, oh, this is elective dentistry. Your insurance won't cover it. Everything we do other than pain control, swelling, bleeding is elective. I mean, a patient's not going to die if they don't get their scaling and replaning. They're not going to die if they don't get that crown. Um, so we have to realize that this is something that we're going to have to let the patient know how it will enhance their lives and how things could go. You know, what are the consequences of not doing this? You know, if, if your surgeon, your cardiac surgeon tells you you need a bypass, well, you're not going to ask all that many questions because this is not this is life or death. That's not really elective. If you've got a cancerous mole in your arm, you're not going to give your dermatologist a hard time when she says we need to remove this thing. <laughs> so dentistry is different. It's elective. And, and people say we've got to always be selling. You know, that might be a little, um, not really crude, but it might be a little overkill. Um, we shouldn't have to sell our patients. We should get them to want this stuff. And I think yes. this um, informative exam is part of that. Let them know the consequences of not doing it is part of that, but also becoming their trusted friend and advisor by you know, doing the personal conversations and taking them back on time and letting them know this is a great office. For me, that's the biggest part of it. So go back to what you just said. Get them to know what they want. Was that what the words that you just used? I'm not sure if I said that, but I like it. Yeah. You said, instead of just telling, you know, instead of just telling, because you're not treating necessarily, you know, the old ain't broken, it don't fix it. You're not treating necessarily. Like you said, in medicine, well, we got this mole, we're going to take it out. Okay, yes, that's fine. You're doing a lot of things that are pretty much asymptomatic. So right. you, you kind of have to educate them to the point where they understand and will want what's better for them. Agreed. They have to want it. 
if you high pressure someone, and I know we've all taken those treatment plan acceptance yeah. courses where it's like a pressure cooker and they've got the flow charts. If they say this, you say that. If they say this, you look them in the eye and say, isn't this the kind of dentistry you want? Blah, 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 blah. It's right. all high pressure stuff. And the way that you're talking about doing it, and you, Sonny, your your demeanor is so calm. And I know not everyone's blessed with that, but it, it seems to come very naturally to you just to be a very matter of fact person. I'm here. I'm here to help. I'm, I'm your mm-hmm. friend. Um, you just seem to have that demeanor. And I think if that doesn't come natural to you, I would work on cultivating that vibe instead of the high pressure treatment plan, back and forth questions that just turn people off. And then if, if you twist someone's arm to say yes, it's always going to backfire. Right. Right. It just is. They yeah, the old, the old you, uh, said. you know, the old questions that you can't say no to, right? Like, right. would you like, would you like to learn how to earn a million dollars a day without doing any work at all? And, yes. And all, no. Like, you know, like that's, that's right. The first that's step the is get a million dollars. That's the first yeah. step. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, that's an old Steve hey, Martin joke. <laughs> right. It's true. Right. It's how to become a millionaire. Step one, get a million dollars. Great stuff. Let's wrap up fairly soon. So what, what would your, uh, what would you do? Let, let's take this example. So you present this to the treatment plan page. You had a nice experience. What would be some of the things that you would sort of close with? How would you sort of, you know, here's the things that we've gone over. We've discussed them. Did you have any questions? Does this sound good to you? How do you kind of wrap that up? Or what do you do for that final next step? Do you yeah, pass it to a, a coordinator? Well, that's a great What's question. I, I got to say, my philosophy on this might be different than um, a high-end dentist of fee, you know, whatever. But this has worked so well for me over the years, and that is, I always do my treatment plans one step at a time. I call it the ninety-second, <laughs> twenty thousand dollars treatment plan that everybody says yes to, and that is, you know, after doing the informative exam, I always focus on what needs to be done next, and usually it's the chief complaint. Usually it's with the patient. Right. You know, the new yeah. patient said they need it anyway, so they. You know, they say, I've got this chip in my back tooth, or I notice my gums are bleeding, or whatever. In, in just about every circumstance, I focus in on that, and we talk about that one specific area, and we talk about how we can make that better. I always use, like using simple phrases like, I know what the issue is, and we can fix it and get you a great result. Just very simple stuff like that. And we explain the procedure, answer any questions they have, get them booked for it, get the financial needs taken care of. And I don't present the whole, throw the list in front of them with each tooth number, each fee, the total is this. That's just not my style. But you do have to tell them about things. You know, you can't let them leave thinking there aren't other needs. So after we get them excited about the chief complaint, scheduled, financials taken care of, I'll say something like, I'll just kind of wing this. As you could probably tell during your examination, there are some other issues going on too. Um, you heard me say the fours and the fives and the sixes. So there's definitely an issue with gum inflammation. And we talk about how more adults lose teeth to gum inflammation than any other um, situation. So as soon as we get this lower right or upper right, whatever tooth I said, in a nice, good, strong, temporary crown, the next step is to see our fantastic hygienist, Becky, for a series of four appointments. And she's going to talk to you about gum disease and how we can prevent this from reoccurring and blah, 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 all that stuff. Now, you've probably heard during the exam, you've got three other teeth with these large, old, three-surface metal and mercury fillings that are breaking down. So we definitely need to take care of those as soon as your gums are in good shape. You're missing a tooth on the lower left and you're missing one on the upper right. There are some great ways these days that we can actually implant a new root structure in there and build a tooth on top of it, and it'll feel just like your natural tooth. It'll be incredible. And you also mentioned you didn't like the way your front teeth look. You've got that one that's a little twisted and the color's a little dark and there's some staining. We can do what's called veneers to give you a Hollywood smile. It'll be incredible. But let's just start with this first step, which is the tooth from the upper right that you talked about when you came in. And they always say, sounds great. So what did I just do? In 90 seconds, I just treatment planned um, four core and crown four quads of scaling and root planing, two implant abutment and crown, eight veneers, I don't know, $25,000 treatment plan. I'm 
never pressuring the patient to say yes or no, because when they say no, you're up the creek. And then we finish the first step and we schedule the next and we schedule the next and we schedule the next. And for many patients, that's boom, 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 just like we like it. For other patients, it's for financial reasons or personal reasons or whatever. I got to wait a few months to do the next step. And we let that be the patient's choice. So I always say, you know, treatment plan success is not about when the patient gets their treatment completed. It's about where the patient gets their treatment completed. I'm more worried that they're going to leave my office. I want to do everything I can to get them to stay. And if that means we provide the greatest experience possible. And if they get all their treatment done in six months, that's the best. But if it takes them two years, I'm willing to put up with that too, as long as they know the consequences, because they did it in my office. And I didn't scare them away to some dentist down the street. So that was kind of a long-winded answer, but that's my treatment plan and philosophy. And I know it's not for everyone, um, but I've had incredible success with it over the years. But see, it's 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 authentic and it's genuine coming out of your mouth, right? Oh, well, thanks. But I but, and I think that is the most important takeaway. It has to be you. It's got to be your words. It's got to come from your heart and soul, your DNA, and. Everybody has different styles. I've never been a fan sure. of that pressure. You know, you get, we get them all the time. You get those calls. Now I'm getting them. Hey, did you take the ERC? Did you take advantage of all that? Uh, oh, my God. I, I, you just stop getting, calling. I, I, there was a time when I got a call or an email or a, a Facebook messenger. They find you on Facebook and message yeah. you. I got that it's, one every day. It happens all the time. At least now my phone will say suspected. Spam. So I, yeah. sometimes I sometimes with those, I answer the phone and I go, excuse me? That's all I say. Because <laughs> I don't, I don't say yes or hello. I say excuse me, and, and then you know it's like oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. and then they'll use my. I'm like okay, you know, over. Too funny. <laughs> well, I appreciate. It. I got to ask you one last question, one final question. If you have the ability to go back in time to any place or time, or, or meet with, talk with anyone, or do anything, where would you go and why? Wow, that's it's a fun a- one. I wish you would have tried. I think you intentionally didn't tell me you were going to ask. Well, this of course, I wasn't going to tell you that, man. <laughs> it's like the um, first thing well, pops in your head. That's usually fun. Yeah. I, well, the first thing that popped in my head was since I'm a real music guy, um, I would just love to go back to Greenwich Village, New York, early '60s when Bob Dylan was up and coming and the whole folk scene playing in small clubs and then you know kind of morphing into what we know as rock and roll and just experience that whole scene i think it will be awesome i think it was just a obviously a different place in time um but that's the first thing that popped in my head i don't know the given an hour to think about it that would actually be my answer but it's great that's though the, but that's the first see, thing that's I authentic yeah. yeah you know i mean you're not you're not going to liverpool you're not hanging with the beatles that was cool so i did that for my 60th birthday um on the actual day of my 60th birthday paul mccartney was playing in liverpool and I asked my wife if she wanted to go with me for a special 60th birthday trip. And she did like the coolest thing a wife has ever done. She said, Rich, you know, I would love to do it, but I think that would actually be more special if you went with your brothers. So Marshall and Dave and I all went to Liverpool to celebrate my 60th birthday and seeing Paul McCartney on the actual day of my birthday. And we did all the Beatles tours and, you know, museums and all that stuff. It was such a blast. That's cool, man. Now, yeah. did you hear his latest? Like, he's, he's upped his game. He's he's eighty, and he's playing over three hour concerts. And he it's blames Springsteen. He's blaming Springsteen. <laughs> he's like, "You're the one that started doing this. I'm trying to keep up. You're doing three three and a half hours now. I'm you know, like, that's great." I just read that. It's hilarious, right? I just, I just yeah. saw him for the second time recently, and uh, he was great. It was it was. The day or two before he turned 80. So it was a pretty cool show. Wow. Syracuse. Very fun. That sounds great. He's amazing. Phenomenal. And he plays yep. 13, 14 instruments during his performance. It's, uh, it's magic. There's only, only one McCartney, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would love to have you back. I'm sure you've got a wealth of more information, and I, I, people love to hear it because it's very yeah, helpful. I, I don't know how many people watched the video, but I just want to say I wrote all these notes for this and we didn't get to any of it because your questions were so good. Seriously, your questions are great. They're insightful. They're fun. And they lead to great conversations. And it's a 
it, it takes a lot of skill to do that. And I know there are a lot of podcasts that are just so boring. And I want to commend you for being such a great host and um, and having the skill and you know whatever the patience to do that. If you don't mind me just saying so, if anybody wants to find out more about what we do, it's just mado.com, M-A-D-O-W dot com is our website. And if anybody wants to email me, my personal email address is rich, R-I-C-H, at Mado, M-A-D-O-W dot com. I'd love to hear questions, comments, um, you know, Bronx cheers, whatever you want to send my way. I respond to all my emails, and I'd love to hear from you. Appreciate it. And if you've got anything you want to share on the show notes, I'll put it there as well. So if there's anything cool. that you, you know, you have a blue form or something like that you want to put out there, we can do that. So. All right. How about if I, can I end, since we, I talked about music so much, Fire away. a quote from Miles Davis, the great jazz yeah. trumpeter, pioneer, the guy's amazing. I'm going to PG, PGI's this quote, because uh, he used a really bad word in it that, you know, some jazz musicians would, would use. Um, he said, anybody can play. The note is only 20%. The attitude of the dude who plays the note is 80%. I might have misquoted him a tiny bit, but... Here's one of the greatest musicians of all time saying anybody can put a trumpet through the lips and make a note. It's the attitude of the person playing it that makes the difference. So um, good food for thought. Be authentic. (laughs) Well, thank you. It was fun, man. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Fee for Service Dentist Podcast. If you would like to share your fee for service story, please fill out our contact form at ffsdentistry.com. Also, Be sure to join our fee-for-service dentistry Facebook group. For help starting your dental membership plan, visit dentalmembershipdirect.com and membershipmastercourse.com. Finally, for help with in-house financing, visit dentalfinancingdirect.com. And don't forget, your story is what you make of it. This is your name on the door and your reputation on the line. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time.